Okay. So it's a big welcome to NUFC Matters to uh, a good friend of mine, Roy Jones Jr. We had the pleasure of meeting on uh, a couple of occasions in Newcastle. Roy, how are you? Doing well. How are you, my brother? I'm very good, mate. I'm very good. Uh, the last time we met, you serenaded me with a bit of rapping, if I remember rightly. Uh, you were very good at it as well. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Top man, top man. Well, great to see you. We've got plenty of questions coming in. Uh, first of all, I want to ask one myself. Um, just about the Mike Tyson exhibition. Uh, it was fantastic to watch it. It was great to see you and Mike getting back in the ring, just watching you walk into the ring. Um, how did you think it went? I think it went pretty well. I think our people that watched it were satisfied. They enjoyed themselves. Um, got a chance to entertain people again because with the COVID situation and so many people being stuck inside of houses and not being able to go, not being able to mingle, not being able to, you know, just to to associate one another, uh, gave them something spe spectacular to see, uh, something to do, and gave some people an opportunity to even gather again uh, with a great call. So I thought it turned out great. Yeah, it was fantastic, mate. Great to see you back in there. And you were both you were both in good shape. The training side of it must have been must have been was it hard work? You know, I mean, it, or was it enjoyable? It was highly gruesome. Trust me, it was highly gruesome, and uh, just enjoyable at the end of the day because you figure out that you did yourself a good job and you got yourself in pretty good shape, and you know you do well. But it's a very gruesome thing to go through, and that's why I tell people now that. If I, don't got, if I don't have my money, a lot of my money up front, I'm not doing it again because it doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? It's too hard to get in shape, too much to go through and to take chances, you know? So if you're not going to have part of it up front, then it doesn't make sense to do it. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the questions. We'll put it out onto social media. We asked people for uh, a few questions. We've got quite a few come in. So that's great. Andrew Lee, uh, he says, can you ask Roy who he felt would have won between himself and Tommy Hearns? Um, I think I would have beat Tommy, but it would have been a good fight because Tommy is a spectacular puncher. But in my prime, I didn't get hit much. So it had been very difficult for Tommy to hit me. And I also knew that Tommy wasn't the guy that liked pressure fighters. So people like Iran Brockley were able to get to him. But uh, like I said, you still had to deal with his tough right hand because he probably had pound for pound one of the best right hands in the business. But uh, outside of that, I couldn't see myself not winning. And the fact that I think I saw Virgil Hill go the distance with him twice. And uh, I stopped Virgil. So maybe his right hand was good to hit. But I don't know. I just think that I felt like I would have won against him in my prime. But it would have been a tough fight because he was a very good puncher. Okay, good stuff. Rob G, uh, he asks, how highly do you rate Joe Calzaghi? I rate him pretty high. Um, you know, Joe was a very good fighter. Don't get it wrong. Uh, he just didn't get to face a lot of top opposition, American opposition, I should say, in his prime. Uh, he fought some international top opposition, um, but we never got, got to see him face top equal American opposition. So that's where you use the base uh, the level of people on how many top Americans they fight in their prime when they're in their prime. So it's like no different than what we, the same argument we can have for other fighters, you know. I mean, a lot of guys we didn't see fight top American fighters in their primes too. So it's hard to rate them until you see prime versus prime. But overall, he had a fascinating story. One of the coolest people you ever could have met. Uh, one of the busiest guys. And I think he's an awesome fighter. Um, but like I say, I wish we could have got to see him fight people like myself in our prime when we both were in our prime. They would have been much better. Okay. Chris Law says, if you could have fought any fighter from any weight and any era, who would it be? Well, of course, it would have been probably the great Muhammad Ali because he's the only one that I thought was up here wittingly, wittingly uh, smarter than me or just as smart because that's why I started boxing because of his wit. So it would have been great to... how the match match up, you know, so that, was, that would have been the one guy I would love to have shared the ring with. Uh, as far as my weight class, I guess the one guy I probably would have wanted to fight would have been Marvin Hagler. He was more, to me, he was more disciplined and he was the same guy every night. You didn't have to worry about him changing. He's going to be Marvin every night. Uh, he would be the guy that probably would have been the better matchup because he took a punch, he gave a punch, he was left-handed or right-handed, he had more to offer than most people. 
Chris, o- Chris also asks, do you regret not retiring at the top of the game or were you happy that you kept on fighting? I was happy that I kept on fighting because I still went out doing what I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it. Uh, that's what made me get to be what I became in boxing, the fact that I believe in doing things the way I wanted to do them and when I wanted to do them. So, um, I mean, had you quit at, at the top of your game, they're still going to try to say that this one's better than you or that one's better than you. So it really didn't matter. Um, had I known what I knew now, I would have stopped for a little while, but I would have came back and punched just in me. So I would have stopped for a little while and let my body be uh, gathered itself because going way up 25 pounds and sweating 25 pounds of muscle off definitely did some damage to the body. And to give the body a chance to recover from that is what I didn't do. Tom Dixon asks, how did you get into the sport? The great Muhammad Ali. My father was a boxer uh, back in 1974. I was about five years old watching my father watch the Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier fight. And my father was so compelled with what Muhammad Ali was doing. And I looked at Muhammad Ali right then and I realized that he was doing it more with his mind or just as much with his mind as he was, as he was with his hand. So I decided that if someone would teach me, teach me how to use my hands, I had the mindset for it already. So if you teach me how to use my hands, I can do what he's doing. And so later on, my father started teaching me to use my hand. And the story goes from there. Okay. Uh, Abra Dubravka says, uh, any suspicion, uh, any superstitions that you had <coughs> pre-fight? Yeah. yeah, my pre-fight superstitions were because I was right-handed. I would put my right glove on first because I wanted to start things out right. <laughs> and that's, that was my superstition. Okay, Big D's got a, a, an interesting question. He says, what sort of regime did you go through when you put on the additional weight to go from light heavyweight to heavyweight? Uh, for the first time in my life, I lifted weight. That was the first and only time in my life I ever really lifted weight. For the first time, I started a weightlifting regimen, and my trainer at the time, I um, can't think of his name right now, but he made me do the weightlifting because he said I wanted to put the muscle on, Mackie Shieldstone. Like his shield stone made me put the muscle on because he knew I had to have more mass, so we put muscle on and we competed. Okay. Uh, Mr. MJR10 on Twitter says, what were your thoughts on the career of Prince Nazim Hamed? One of the most exciting guys you ever want to see. I uh, was very happy that someone else understood that you should entertain the fans while you're entertaining yourself. So while you're doing your job, what makes your job better or, make, what makes you better at doing your job what makes people more interested in your work is if you can entertain them while you're doing your job. And that's what he did, just like what I did. He took a page out of my book. I was very thrilled to see that. So I loved his career. Obviously, with um, social media these days, it's it's changed things a lot. How important do you think social media is, Roy? I think it's pretty important in a way, but at the same time, it's also kind of harmful because Guys now get on and have social media wars, but they never stand face to face and talk about it. So it's like, I don't want to hear what you got to say behind social media. Come say it to my face. You feel me? That's what old school did. So it's good in a way, but it's bad because these guys can talk and sound so tough on social media. Yeah, when it comes down to the real action, nothing happens. So it's kind of sometimes it's time to be a letdown because you build up so much hype in the social media era on the social media scene. And then the fighters are let down. So you didn't back up all the things you prompted us to believe in the social media. You didn't back up none of that when it came to actuality. And that's why it hurts people. What was your toughest fight, Roy? Oh, my toughest fight was the first time when I beat Antonio Tarver because I was very weak. I had shed 25 pounds of muscle, had no energy, but refused to leave that ring without the WBC light heavyweight belt. So it was like I had everything, nothing in me at all, and I still won. And I refused to leave that without that victory because that was my goal. And what really happened in my career was after I did that, I had accomplished all my goals. So at that, from that point forward, I wasn't really goal-driven anymore. I had to get everything I wanted to do. That's when you should stop and go reset a new goal or you should stop fighting. So I don't regret not stopping, but I do regret not resetting or setting a new goal because I wanted to go be middleweight champ, Super middleweight champ, light heavyweight champ, heavyweight champ, then recapture the light heavyweight champ title later. And if you did that, then you did what Bob Fitzsimmons did. Now, what I didn't know at the time was that Bob Fitzsimmons only had a middle and heavyweight champ, and then title, and then the light heavyweight division came along 
after he won the heavyweight belt and he became light heavyweight champ too. I didn't know that. I thought he won middleweight, light heavyweight, heavyweight, and recaptured the light heavyweight. So in order for me to do what I thought he had done, I had to recapture the light heavyweight title. So that's how I got into that. Which fight do you look back on in your career with the, the most amount of pride? Which do you think was your best fight? That's a lot of them, man. It's hard to say. I don't really think one particular one was my best fight. And this, this is because of the fact that I have so many tools and so many weapons that certain fights I use certain weapons, other fights I use other weapons. And all of it is equal to me because they all were me. So, yeah, the James Hunter fight was masterful because of the way I mentally did it. But so was the Montero Griffin rematch because of the way I mentally did it. Yeah, so was the John Ruiz fight because of how I mentally did it. Yeah, so was the Reggie Johnson fight because of that combination of the way I mentally did that. Yes, so was the Jeff Lacey fight because I was beyond weight, far beyond my prime, and still, still put on one of the best performances of my life. So it's so much, so many of them that I can name all that, you know, it's hard to say. Looking at boxing at the moment, obviously with COVID, it's, um, you know, it's it's a lot different to, you know, what we usually expect. I mean, obviously you had that big, big exhibition fight, but there's no, you know, no supporters there. It's very difficult. Is it more apparent now how important the fans are to boxing? Yes, it's definitely more apparent now because if I were boxing right now, I still would have a whole huge pay-per-view audience because of the fact that they knew that they paid to watch me, they was going to get something. Something other than just boxing. They can get boxing and beyond. You don't get boxing and beyond, you can get boxing anywhere. But where can you get boxing and beyond boxing? Ray Jones Jr., Prince Nassim Hamid, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson. Those names are not really there right now. Yeah, no, exactly. Talking about big fights, um, it's it's expected in the next couple of weeks that we're going to hear um, the you know the, the the location of Tyson Fury against Anthony Joshua. Um, what do you make of both fighters, and you know who do you see coming out on top in that in that particular fight? I'm a huge fan of both fighters. I think both fighters are very brilliant fighters, um, and it, I don't know who will come out on top because here's what I see. Uh, that, we're de- that we're dealing with. Anthony Joshua is a very good, talented kid. He's a highly talented guy. But he hasn't developed the IQ in the ring that uh, uh, Fury had. Fury has a high IQ. He's not the most talented guy. He has a very high IQ. That IQ allows him to outthink and outmanipulate most people. He was able to beat the Pittsburgh brother. He was able to beat Wilder twice. I mean, come on. It tells you he doesn't have the punch power that neither one of them have. But he beat both of them with the IQ. When you have a guy who has a high IQ and just a little bit of skill behind that high IQ, he's very difficult to deal with. And I think Fury is always going to be a very difficult guy to deal with because not only does he have a high IQ, he's also about 6'8", six, 6'9", six, tall. So he presents so many problems just off of his physical abilities just because of his physical stature, along with him having a good IQ. You have to give him the edge against pretty much all the heavyweights right now. But Anthony Joshua is a guy that has the talent that could change anything. He could change anything at any time. So you don't count Anthony Joshua out, Joshua out because he definitely has the talent. But me, I would have to lean more toward Fury going in. Yeah, I, I personally feel you know Fury's a technically better <clears throat> fighter. I think it's I think it's a great match. Um, you know, wh- whenever and wherever it happens, I think it'll be it'll be a big big money fight. Getting back to the exhibitions, uh, have you got anything else planned? Is there anything else on the horizon with those kind of fights? Well, I mean, I've been hearing some things, but there's also been a lot of talk about me fighting Glenn McCory in the exhibition over in the UK. Uh, these guys at Tough Boxing have been talking to me about it. Nothing really has come to fruition yet because, like I said, for me, I got to have a good chunk of change to even be willing to get in shape again or not really worth my while. So I hear the talks of it. I hear people speaking about it. And I say, Glenn McCord, he wanted Holyfield. Holyfield didn't want to do that. He just wanted to go with Tyson because they're making something like $200 million to do an exhibition in Dubai here. So <clears throat> since Glenn wanted to do it, and I always wanted to fight in the UK, I thought if we can make good money out of it, it could be something worth my while because I would love to come to the UK and perform for my fans once. Although I'm older, I'm still just as fast as anybody fighting the day. I may not take as much as I used to take back in the day, but I still can give just as much as I gave back then. So I feel like I'm still a, a good commodity to watch because I'm always going to show you something in the boxing ring. And I'm always going to show you something a little bit different in the boxing ring. Um, that being said, if we can work the particulars out, then it's possible that that will happen. 
if it doesn't work out, then you know it didn't happen. It just because we couldn't get the fight. Pound for pound, who do you think is the best fighter on the planet at this moment in time? Active, active fighters, I would probably have to say is a toss up between the two guys that deserve it most, which is Terrence Crawford and Canelo Alvarez. And right now, Alvarez is facing more opposition, more high quality opposition, so you have to give it to him. Well, Terrence Crawford is a close second or, or number one A and one B because Terrence has been so dominant his whole career, he takes on whoever they bring to him. Uh, the only problem we got right now is we, we can't seem to get him and Earl Spence in the ring together, but I wish we could because that probably would solidify him as the number one pound fighter to beat Earl. But right now, I have to go with Canelo because he went all over the light heavyweight, destroying everybody. Um, and, you know, he only has the, basically lost to Floyd Mayweather, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, but that's kind of dominated. Triple G gave him some good runs, good matches, but, you know, the way those things panned out with the trainers talking and saying what kind of fighters they wanted to fight and all kind of took away from uh, Triple G, G's ability to win the fight. So, um, right now, I think Canelo would probably be 1A and Terrence Crawford 1B. And you could flip them either way because Terrence Crawford also brings a, a whole lot to the table. Is there any advice that you would give to uh, a youngster potentially watching this who is, uh, you know, involved in the amateur game now and is thinking about turning professional? Keep God first in everything you do. Always get yourself in condition and don't consider your opponent as much as you consider your fans. The fans are far more important than your opponent. Because once you beat your opponent, he's not an opponent no more. He's on to the next. But your fans, they're always going to be there. So if you ever get them addicted to you, you got something. Where my one opponent, opponents will change. Opponents will always come about. But your fans, they won't. You might add a few, but if you got good ones and you loyal to them and you give them something to look at, they won't always be your fans. Got another question from Chris Law. He said, what was the feeling like losing at the Olympics, knowing that you won every second of that fight? Worst feeling ever until a few days later when I finally realized that God was giving me something that I could not have gotten on my own. God was giving me world notability that I never would have captured on my own. Had I won a gold medal, nobody would have even cared about what I did in the potential or who I was or where I came from. But because I got raw, I became more notable than all the people that won a gold medal because of what happened to the guy that got robbed. Not the guys that got the gold medal, not the guys that got the silver medal, not the guys that got the bronze medal, not the guys who didn't make it to the middle round, but what happened to the guy that got robbed? That's what every my inquiring minds wanted to know. That made me more popular than anything that I could have ever dreamed of doing in the Olympics. And that's the work of God on it. What do you think about the, you know, the the state of, you know, drugs in boxing, uh, Roy? There's a lot of, you know, a lot of these tests which are, you know, proven positive. There's been some big names tested positive. You know, what can the authorities do to stamp that out? It's hard to stamp it out because anything that people can do to better themselves, they're going to use to try to do. So it'll be very difficult to stamp it out. However, Vada is doing a great job. Like they showed up testing me and Mike every, every as often as they could. You know, like every other week or so, they were showing up at your front door six o'clock in the morning. Here, you got to pee in this cup. And that's the best way to do it because if they do that, it doesn't give you an opportunity to cheat. You feel me? But other than that, if you don't do something like Vada does, they're going to cheat. Okay. Uh, come to the last part of the uh, the the, uh, the Q&A. Who was the toughest opponent and why, says Ryan Wise? Well, one of my toughest opponents, and I always tell people this, and people don't want to believe it, but it's the truth. And the toughest opponent I ever fought was James Tony because he had more skill than most of anybody I fought. He had offensive skill. He had defensive skill. He was a complete fighter, and that always makes it hard. But the toughest guy that I actually fought that I had the toughest time with dealing with this friend. It wasn't long, but he was the toughest, hardest hitting guy that I fought pound for pound until I got in the ring with Mike Tyson. It was a guy by the name of Murky Sosa. Murky Sosa was the strongest, hardest hitting, most awkward guy that I ever seen in my life. Now I stopped him, but he was a very difficult task to overcome. And uh, I overcame him and I knew what it was going to take, but I just didn't know he was as strong or punched as hard as he did until we were in there. I was like, whoa, okay, he can punch by like me. It's pretty interesting. So, you know. Boxing films, final question. Um, favorite boxing movie, Roy? Have you got one? Because boxing's a hard thing to take off. Are, are you a Rocky fan or is it, uh, you know, something a bit different? No, I don't really have good favorite boxing movies. I really don't usually watch boxing movies as much. Because when you're into boxing, you know the reality of it. 
to the box of movies don't really bring the best feeling to us. You feel me? Because I know guys that go through those lifestyles for real. And who have actually went out competing and did these things for real. And they don't get treated quite as good as these guys do in the movies. So it's like, I'm a little bit not so into boxing movies. You know, my wife loves Rocky. Um, <clears throat> I never, <clears throat> never really watched pretty, pretty much none other than probably Rocky, but I ain't watched a lot of Rocky movies. But I hear Southpaw was good. I hear The Fighter was good. Uh, the one with Gotti and uh, Ward, I heard that was good. There's so many, all boxing movies usually do really good because they give people hope. That's what the one good thing about boxing movies are, they're hope stories. And hope stories always sell because you give people hope. Boxers usually come from uneducated, low income backgrounds, and they over exceed by excelling in boxing. And that's hope. That's hope for those who can't go to college. Hope for those who couldn't pass tests to go to the military. Hope for those who don't have a law degree. Hope for those who can't be a doctor. Hope for those who may not even be able to read. But boxing gives them hope. That's why the boxing movies are always so good. What's your views on UFC? Are you a big fan? Yes, I am. I love the UFC. I think UFC is the ultimate, ultimate I mean, one of the best sports. I think it's the ultimate sport for fighting, and um, I love it. Leon Spinks as well. Sadly, we lost him. Another great legend, Roy. Yes, another really great legend. Uh, man, we're losing so many people right now due to this COVID and just different things, man. Been very drastic, brother. It's been very hard to swallow. And my my prayers goes out to his family. Um, Corey Spinks, you know, I'm friends with a lot of his family, and you know, it's very tough to see to see the boxing world continue to lose beautiful people. But the whole world is losing beautiful people people because of this coronavirus. So we all are losing people because of Corona, and it's very tough, it's hard to even talk about it. So I find myself stuttering trying to speak about it, but <laughs> it's very difficult to lose great loved ones, people that did and meant so much to the sport. It is. Uh, finally, a message to the fans in England, Roy. Hey, God bless you all. Thank you all for your support throughout the years. If it's any way possible for us to make the fight with game of courage just so I can come over and possibly do an exhibition. I know he said he wants to knock me out, so you know, I know it won't be an exhibition. It'll be another situation like Mike. They'll say they are, but they're trying to knock you out, trying to take your head off. So I already understand and expect that, and you know that it will be mutual. So uh, if it all works out properly, I would look forward to being able to get one opportunity to perform for you guys. And if I do, you better believe that Roy Jones Jr. will make the best of it to make sure you guys enjoy the Roy Jones Jr. experience, even at, 50, even at 52 years old. It's going to be a tough one for me because I'm good friends with Glenn McCrory, but I'm good friends with you as well, Roy. I think, to be honest, I've got to stick with the champ. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, been an absolute pleasure. I know you're a busy man. Um, at Real Roy Jones Jr. on Twitter, give him a follow. And uh, Roy, look forward to seeing you when all this madness dies down. Thanks very much for your time. Take care, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say shout out to Eubanks Jr. family, shout out to Mikey family, and shout out to my man Fizz family. Okay. Thank you, guys. Take care, mate. God bless you.